Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hello, lovely to see you, Miss Stella. <laughs> Hello there, my darling. Um, it's 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 great to be having a, a, an episode together where you and I are chatting. I always yeah. think that's really, it feels like we're back home. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I love these episodes. It's really engaging and interesting and they always go in fun directions. But, but before we get to that, what is going on in the life of Stella O'Malley? Loads, loads. So much so my head is spinning. I think uh, what's really, I suppose, really on my mind at the moment is me and you and Lisa Marciano are finishing the edits of our book Woo-hoo! and the edits of the book. Oh, I wait, know. Let, me use, <laughs> let me use our cool sound effects. Hold on. Can you, can you say that again? <laughs> okay. We're, we're coming to the close of the edits of our book. Oh crap. I can't find it <laughs> next time. All right. Imagine there's okay. clapping. Woo! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a very interesting time because I think I'd say editors don't like me because when I get the, I've had a few books, I've written a few books and when I get the edits, I I, I input a lot. Well, I think mm. I'm meant to only kind of do little bits and pieces. I'm like, oh no, this will be much better. And I actually, just so you know, Sasha, I moved an entire chapter of mine from one place to another. Okay, great. Going, <laughs> Stop, <laughs> drop it, Stella. <laughs> but anyway, I always think of this study that was very interesting years ago that I read. I was about architects and now I, I'm going to sound <gasps> oh very Oh my inflated. God, it's so weird that you say that because we're in the process of buying a house and every house we walk into, my fiance, the architect goes, we'd put this wall over there, we'd move this room over here. <laughs> so, okay, keep going. <laughs> That's my, so my funny. Husband, my husband, the builder, slags off right. architects who, t- who talk like that. <laughs> but um, yeah, there was this study on architects and they, they, they tried to figure out why are some world class and why are some just very good and what is the difference now I'm not saying I'm world class but I did think it was interesting about the inspired kind of stroke of genius vibe and the people who were very good would work to the deadline and the people but they would get it well in before deadline but people who are brilliant would get (laughs) right up to the deadline right up to the deadline they're working and I just I console myself with that (laughs) I love that yeah so so we're 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 working on the glossary you've just been working I think on the glossary or the 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 organizations yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's and been it's really good. interesting. This is the second time we write together, you and I, yeah. um, and this is the first time that I write with both you and Lisa. And it's going to be well. I mean, it's a parenting book for people who have kids struggling with gender issues, and it really feels very much like the podcast project in a way. Like this is crucial yeah. information. A lot of people ask us about these things. We need to get this out. And writing a book together has been a really it's been a fun process and it went way smoother than I thought. I mean, I know, I know. you remember I I kind of I dragged have been you into saying it. <laughs> I loathe writing. I this is not me. I'll never write a book. Like there were so many nevers in my life. I'll never have my own practice. That would be miserable. I'll never write a book. I hate writing and here we are. I don't know what's coming next. But um, it's actually was really a way smoother process than I thought. Yeah. Because I, this uh, stuff, I kind of thought it would be. Yeah. yeah, and we it's could have written insane. like four times the amount of yeah. words we wrote. I mean, I really had to yeah. rein it in. So yeah. it's going to be great. I'm really excited about it. And, and the writing process was interesting because there was, um, it, the last time you and I wrote together, we wrote together. You might yeah. write one bit. And that was quite hard to navigate, yeah. even though we did it. But yeah. this time it was, you wrote some chapters, I wrote some chapters. And yet the editor, when they looked at it, they didn't seem to see a big jump. And, yeah. and there was one chapter in particular that I thought, did I write this or did somebody yeah, else write yeah, this? Yeah. I genuinely didn't know. So It's, it's going to be nice, been... seamless transitions, I think. I think it's going to be great. I hope it's going to be really, really helpful. I, um, so I did another thing I did this week was I did my my sub stack. I did a, a, a kind of a case study of an ROGD teen and it was just how a therapist would work. And it was Ooh. really amazing. I felt how many parents 
thought that um, it, this was really valuable information. They didn't know what would go on in the therapist's office, even though you and I talk about yeah. it all the time. Yeah. It feels like we're the Wizard of Oz behind the green curtain doing mm-hmm. some sort of voodoo. And it's, it's, it's very important that we normalize just this is a relationship. It's a dynamic yeah. with yeah. some extra insight on thoughts and patterns of behavior. And I mean, if parents find that kind of information valuable, I would recommend, I mean, obviously coming to your Substack, coming to my Subscribestar, because I talk about that stuff too, but also Geta has been doing these these webinars where we launched our clinical guide and like, we're really trying to put out information about, okay, how, how can we practically on the ground in therapy work with gender issues in a way that actually is going to feel quite familiar to anyone who's a therapist. So if somebody out there is like a parent or a therapist or a school counselor or whatever, and they're like, how actually does this therapy look? And you're imagining that it's this kind of mystical thing with lots of crazy language. It's actually not. It's very normal therapy. But I I recommend kind of checking that stuff out too, also through through Geta. But yeah, so so that sounds interesting on your Substack. Do you take live questions too, or how does it work? For I do. Yours? I tend to record the presentation and then take live Q and A afterwards, where it's just ourselves, oh, just cool. to kind of give people an opportunity to be, you know, to feel less like they're being recorded and yeah. it'll go out in the world. Because I know some people are very very private, and they're yeah. right to be. When your family is in the middle oh, yeah. of something, I could, yeah. I think it's yeah. really important. I so did I, a I, I record oh, that bit mm. and then let it out. Yeah, go on. Yeah. What, what did you do? Um, I did a recording this month for January in my parent membership group. And it was a, it was a response to a question about like something I had said once in a consult. So I had consulted with someone and she was talking about her daughter binding because she's uncomfortable with the attention she gets in her, with her breasts. And, and I said something like, you know, I can totally understand that. And all women have to learn to live in the world with the kind of type of energy or attention or sexual, you know, stuff coming from men. We have to figure out how to live in it. And so she says, can you expand on that? So I ended up actually talking wow. about how eating disorders have a lot of similarities to gender dysphoria Huge. in the in that they kind of desexualize the body. Like you either become Huge. really skin or if you have a compulsive eating disorder, you become quite heavy and you kind of de-emphasize certain aspects of like what is prototypically considered a feminine body. So we talked a little bit about that in January and then February, I'm going to give some ideas on like how young people and how families can support young people in in actually just living your life and not being as overwhelmed by that type of attention or energy. So it's, it's yeah. a, it was an interesting uh, project. We should do an episode on, um, I suppose, the, 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 the extraordinary power of the female sexuality. Yeah. And how it's so overwhelming for us. It's so shocking to be a, a kind of an object of an extreme amount of yeah. sexual attention. Yeah. It's such a shockingly difficult thing. No wonder girls just go, ah. Yeah. You know, and and I, on the I other really side, think... I, I think boys are overwhelmed by their own propensity for being aroused and feeling attracted and not knowing mm. what to do with their own experiences and sexuality. So I think to do it, yeah. I mean, how have we not, have we not done an episode on sexuality? How is that possible? Hmm. <laughs> Where have we been? We really, we really should do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, note to self. Okay, we will. All right, but today, today's episode is yeah. all about, uh, let's give some context. So if, if you're yeah. new to this whole world and you're like, why are they talking about bi and pan and trans? It's because oftentimes what we have experienced is that when young people are starting to question their identity, it often begins with a declaring of a bisexual or agender or pansexual gender identity or sexual identity quite young. And then over time, that seems to evolve. Like one month, the kid says she's bi. Parents are like, no big deal. Doesn't matter. Don't label yourself. Just take your time. Then the next month she's pan and they're like, what does that mean? Are you attracted to like uh, cookware? And she's like, no, actually pan is a sexuality (laughs) involving, which we'll explain. And then oftentimes it kind of graduates almost to a transgender identity, like a cross sex kind of identity. Yes. So we thought it would be interesting today to kind of explore what does this mean? Why are kids kind of going down this like yellow brick road of different identities and landing on trans? And and, I mean, I'm sure you're seeing the same thing 
Um, what, what do you I think? Feel, yeah, I, 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 yeah, and I'm really into us doing this in this episode because I feel an awful lot of parents feel blindsided because bisexual, they're going, okay, grand, sex is starting to emerge in, in right. the child's life. Get it. And they're mm. testing the waters. They're starting to explore. All, 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 all right here. You know what I mean? Then they say pansexual. They think, oh, yeah, right. OK, I get it. This is something to do with the kind of new generation. I get it. You know, yeah. new kind of rock and roll type thing. And they're rolling with it. And then there's a sudden swerve left into a gender identity. And it's like, I thought we were talking about your sex. Yeah. What is this? This is completely different. And the parents see it completely different. And the children are like, it's all part of the same jigsaw. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't, the parents are often going, well, a whole new event has happened here. And the children are often saying, what are you talking about? And so begins the two divergent roads. Yeah. Of the, of the parents and the children. They, 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 then they're off on two different roads from yeah. the beginning, really, yeah. as soon as the, the transit. That's how I see it. What, what? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's right, because it definitely takes a turn when all of a sudden you go from talking about like who you might be interested in dating versus like, I literally don't think I'm in the right body anymore. That it does feel like a huge jump. But and I think you're... About, you're Mm. Yeah, your relationship to other people. Right. The other than relationship to very yourself. different. Yeah. And yeah. I think you're you're right to point out that within the world of the young people, this seems like very much in the same ballpark. Um, because they're again, I mean, I've said this a lot, a lot of young people are looking at lists of identity labels that are accompanied by like really cool looking flags and symbols and you know definitions and like YouTube videos and they're reading and reading and reading and all of this is kind of mushed together under one ginormous yeah. quote queer umbrella or LGBT umbrella. Yeah. So to the child, it's not a leap at all to say this. But I think maybe before we get into the analysis or the nitty gritty, let's just, let's attempt and I say attempt because there's not any clear consensus on what these words even mean. But let's attempt to kind of define these and then we can get into like what we think is going on beneath the surface story. So okay. when you hear when you hear bisexual, I know there's many things. Tell me all the things that you think that that means. Well, maybe I'm simple, but I, I think I just <laughs> I think, think you are not a simple woman, Stella. <laughs> no. I can say that. <laughs> I'm a lot of things, but I'm not very simple. Um, but I, to be simplistic, I I see bisexual as you're attracted to a man or a man and a woman, and it, it, it's it's kind of ironic to me that you know the clue is in the name when they said LGBT B suggested that there was two sexes implicitly. And it's it's yeah. almost it's almost a, it's almost s strange that there's B in this whole um, massive acronym because the B suggests that there should only be LGB. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because oh, yeah. the B actually it, B kind of ruins everything really because it says bisexual. There's only two, mm -hmm. so I see B as becoming anachronistic. People are going to use that as an old fashioned term, yeah. I would say, in the future. Right now it's being used blithely, but it, it has a, an inherent kind of flaw in its existence. Now, it's so according strong. To, the, according to certain people, but I mean, not necessarily. Yeah, you're right, because it's expanding like an awful lot of uh, you know, concept creep, it's expanding its understanding. So yeah. other people don't have my my understanding of bisexual. It's just mine is just straight bisexual is you 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 fancy men and women. Yeah. Right. That's how I see it. Yeah, no, completely. And I mean historically that's been the way the term is used. And I don't think there was any I mean, I could be wrong. I'm not like an LGBTQ historian, but I don't think there was much controversy about this, for example, when I was like in school. It was gay, straight, and bi. And yeah. there was there was an emergent understanding that there are also kind of gradients or spectrums of this. So just because someone's bisexual doesn't mean they're 50% attracted to women and 50%, you know, people recognize oh, yeah. that it kind oh, yeah. of... 
But um, now what I've noticed, just kind of poking around on the internet, like I try not to get too deep into activist uh, debates and activist um, kerfuffles, <laughs> but there <laughs> is controversy about the term bisexual and there are people mm -hmm. within the like activist community. And interestingly, like when I was reading up about this, everybody interviewed was like 25 or younger, like nobody really grown up like was being interviewed <laughs> about this issue. But some people are actually really hanging on to the bisexual label because they do feel like it has historical significance. You know, this oh. is one of the original, you know, labels that people fought hard to be recognized with this sexual That's orientation. Nice. Um, and then there are people, of course, who say it's not inclusive. So let's explain that to any newbie listeners. You know, if somebody says they are bisexual and the implication is that they're explicit or they're they're exclusively attracted to men who were born men or women who were born women, then by definition, they are excluding trans women or uh, trans men. But what's very interesting, I saw somebody in this article saying, well, because trans women are literally the same as biological women, the word bisexual doesn't exclude anybody. So it's kind of being like reframed <laughs> to actually mean kind of by gender sexual attraction yeah. in a way. So I think that's interesting. Um, and I think that's why the term pansexual was created to say, okay, well, if you're only attracted to men who were born men and women who were born women, I am attracted to any kind of man, including trans men or any kind of woman, including trans women. So I think pan mm -hmm. generally is understood to mean someone who's attracted to any possible variation of gender slash sex slash identity that exists. You know, and non-binary. Which are the, because, the sluttiest yeah. of the, the sexualities. <laughs> which back in my day, people who were bisexual were called slutty, which of course is not true. But this is like the new, <laughs> the new, like, yeah. I, will, I will hook up with anybody. And of course, this is a joke, people in YouTube. Just that's a joke. <laughs> I'm not literally calling pansexual people sluts. Okay, continue yeah. on. <laughs> um, the, 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 bi the bisexual thing is, uh, you know, we are kind of imposing this understanding that it's men who are born men and women who are born women. Up until 10, 15 years ago, nobody had to make that because it didn't come in. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, it didn't yeah. come into consciousness. So people weren't consciously encompassing or thinking about this. So I, I can't help but think, well, that just got imposed after the event. You, you know what I mean? Before that, just bisexual. Nobody was thinking like that. Yeah. I think an awful lot of young people, perhaps especially girls, are coming out as bisexual to be to be polite. They want to say, I, I like you all and there's nobody I don't like. And um, uh, frankly, often they, they haven't got much of a sexual awakening and they're just trying to say, no, no, everybody is. I like everybody can come to my yeah. party. Yeah, and it's it's very My sweet. Pants but party. <laughs> I'm like being really weird today. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I totally and agree with you because yeah. a lot of times it's like, you know, the kids eleven or something, and they tell their mom, "Mom, I have something to tell you." You know, I'm bisexual <laughs> or pansexual, and the mom is like, "You know, I've I've literally had this conversation with their parents." Says, oh, so do you want to kiss another girl or do you want to kiss that person? And they go, oh, gross, no. Like, I don't want to <laughs> kiss anybody. So sometimes you're right. I think it's it's a very innocent way of saying, of course I would, because, you know, there's a lot of talk now about, you know, romantic or aromantic. So they're talking about kind of these identity labels also within the context of like your affinity towards somebody, which doesn't necessarily have a sexual component. So it's like when you think about teenage friendships, can you feel deeply emotionally drawn and connected to another girl or a trans guy at school or whomever? Of course. So I think they're kind of using that rather than like, I have this burning desire in my loins, you know, like, I don't think it's necessarily <laughs> that yet. For the pan. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, to be serious, though, there's one thing that I think has happened that I think I'd like people to, to think on is that, you know, we worried a lot over the last couple of decades about the early sexualization of children. That, that mm. has been something yeah. that has worried yeah. us. And I think 
even when I was a kid, it was happening. It was rampant. And I think it really distorted my own sexual awakening as a result. You know, the, you know, we were we were playing games. They were very sexualized. We were way too young to be doing it. We were out of our depth. And when I look back, it was it wasn't nice. I don't know what it was. It was supposed to be exploration. I suppose that's how it would be termed. But it wasn't nice. And I do think when children are surrounded, pre-sexual children as such, before mm -hmm, they've had a sexual mm -hmm. awakening, I think when they are faced with sex, it's icky. It's 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 gross. Yeah. That is the response. Yeah. Just like if I'm, uh, if I'm exposed to sex that is icky, I, we have a very visceral reaction. Yes. I yes. think children have that reaction. So I think all these, this is my theory, I, I don't think many people, well, lots of people will probably agree, that all these girls and boys who have been asked who do they fancy and all that, there's an there's a kind of there's some of them are really quite put off by it. Yeah. But it's it's social currency. It's very much in. It's cool. They're 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 very they're at the very same time they're becoming very aware socially. This might be they might be ten, eleven, twelve. Some of them have no sexual awakening, and it's been foisted upon them. It's pretty gross, kind of instinctively, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's huge in school. It's like the new kind of event. And everybody's yeah. talking about it and they feel completely out of their depth and like, yeah, yeah, I'm bisexual. And mm, then it's, mm -hmm. who do you fancy? Do you remember all that intensity? Who do you fancy? Who do you fancy? Yeah, who do you fancy? Yes, yes. And I think a lot of children are feeling really pressured by that. Mm -hmm. So they might move from bisexual to pansexual, just kind of go, listen, everybody, everybody, just yes. stop talking about yes. it. Mm -hmm. You're so right, because I remember a long time ago... Uh, a detransitioned young woman named Benji, who's in Canada, she was oh, doing yeah. a lot of interviews for a while. And I did an interview with her on Benjamin Boyce, I think. And she was talking about how, like, in the kind of um, dating apps, like, she was on these dating apps from a very young age, like, originally to meet friends, I think. But she was, you know, the, you're prompted to, like, put in all of your identity labels. And what she was explaining is that when you're, like, 16 and you're on one of these, like, dating apps... If you say that you're bisexual or pansexual or whatever, the assumption is that you're also kind of like ready to in engage sexually yeah. with anyone who contacts you. So you're, you're totally right to point out this kind of pressure to be sexually ready before you're actually sexually ready. And I mean, mm -hmm. th this kind of makes me think about parents who say, well, my child says she's asexual. And it's like, well... Of course, because you're right. They have this kind of visceral disgust reaction when they're not really ready yet to even think about yeah. these types of sexuality labels. And so that might become this kind of safe space. So it's, it's interesting, like claiming to be pan keeps you safe from accusations of exclusion. Like you don't want to Very exclude so. anyone. But then calling yourself asexual kind of gets you this freedom to opt out of the entire game. Very much so. Whereas and, I and doubt that a young person today could say something like, you know, I'm still figuring out, I'm figuring it out. I'm not really interested in, in dating you or something like just rejecting someone I think would be considered a complete uh, no, no. But if you say, oh, I'm asexual, then it's like, oh, okay. And and no one's going to pressure you. Perhaps I don't know, but I yeah, well, don't know. nobody's going to gonna say I ha I haven't sexually awoken yet. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm and still no, sleeping. I, I, I'm hitting the snooze button on sexuality. <laughs> and it feels so much part of. Are you cool yet? Who do you fancy? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's really it's as cool as your school bag and as your your shoes. Totally. And. And so they're, they're feeling like, I feel that it's really pressurizing on them. I think we haven't, it used to be kind of cute and um, it was portrayed cutely in, in movies. You know, the, the little boy would kiss the little girl and it's all so sweet. And I don't know, it's, it's not, you know, it's and not I, very sweet. I have sweet. to say, I don't think it ever even felt sweet. Like I remember now as we're talking, being that age and just feeling so scared and intimidated and it's not like anybody was doing anything actually like sexual to me or with me, but it was just like being put in that position or being in a group of girls who are like talking about these things 
which they might have been exaggerating or some of it could have been not true. But I remember that pressure feeling so overwhelming and scary. And you're right. I think it, it has something to do with like your, your status about coolness. And so I think this is the new way that kids are trying to prove themselves cool and hip and edgy and with it and whatever they have to do to kind of display themselves in that way. And I think like a lot of the kids that we tend to work with or who we consult about, they tend to be actually kids who are maybe kind of hitting those typical milestones at a slightly later time. They're not the kids going out there and having sex really young where a lot of kids are, but they're not. So it's like at least staking a claim to some identity becomes your way of signaling that I actually am into this, just like all these other kids who are claiming to be having sex yeah. or doing whatever. And I mean, you, we also yeah, didn't even you, talk about porn. Like there's a lot that kids are dealing with today that is really different from a different generation. In in my memory, when I was a kid, I remember the girls, it was, are you cool yet? Who do you fancy? Are you cool yet? That was the implicit mm. question with the boys. Cause I remember I hung around as much, well, more probably with boys, but they were so filthy. The yeah. way they spoke about sex was like, you know, okay, we didn't have porn, but they were porn. Mm -hmm. The way they spoke, it was so pornified. Like, now, obviously, they must have been porn influenced and I as a girl wasn't or something. You know what I mean? That it mm -hmm. must have been going through their channels in a way it wasn't with me. But I just remember the way they spoke. It was utterly pornographic and incredibly brutal. And I would think that to me the pathway from bi to pan is we were kind of just discussing it was a mm. way of being inclusive and I'm not sure I'm ready I whatever and if the child is saying "Ooh, I don't want to talk about who I fancy I don't fancy anybody and then they come out with a gender identity to me in my version of reality that's a clear example of sexual repression or you know a clear example of gender identity is going to cover this because actually you're all talking about sex and you're freaking me out I'm moving over to gender where it's much more comfortable much more comfortable and and not just that but gender gives a concrete explanation for the visceral discomfort that they're feeling it oh becomes God, yeah. gender dysphoria. It's like, yeah. oh no, I can't actually get in a relationship because I have gender dysphoria and I'm uncomfortable oh with God. my body. Yeah. I swear, I mean, if if I had this, so I would have right. I would have felt that way. I was a really yeah. late bloomer and I was so uncomfortable, but there was like no opt out because you were a loser when I was a kid if you opt out, you know? Totally. But I think Nobody a lot of these kids out. feel that visceral disgust and discomfort and unreadiness and and they're looking around them thinking well, if all these other kids are fine with this, there must be something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not actually a girl. If girls are supposed to love giving blowjobs or being sexually available all the time, then I'm not a girl. This is not what I want. And that's part of the reason I think that there's A, an incredible amount of secrecy and shyness around it, and B, like a desperate clinging to these labels because it feels like their safety raft in a scary, choppy kind of river. Wow. And did you say there that the secrecy, because I have my own theories there, I just want to clarify what you're thinking. The secrecy around their gender identity is a reflection on the fact that there is some sort of sexual component to it or am I running with the wrong ball here? Meaning, like, I think when we're dealing with that kind of visceral shame and disgust that originates around sexual awakening and sexual relationships, I think it, it in and of itself always involves a lot of secrecy. So, yeah, I mean, not that it's a deliberate secrecy, but it's it's so private. I mean, it's these are kids who are late bloomers, so they don't want to talk about their body discomfort or their shame around their breasts or, I mean, if somebody has made a comment about their body that's a sexual comment, like they internalize that shame. And so they don't, then the gender dysphoria gets deeply wrapped up with that. Like, you know, for some kids, the gender dysphoria is more like a proud label that they wear. But then for other kids, it's very painful and they're really secretive and they don't want to talk about it. And it's not just because maybe they are imbibing a lot of like ideological beliefs like it's partially that but I think it's also like 
this kind of existential sexuality related shame that is happening for a lot of young people throughout time, throughout history. I think that's very interesting. I'd look back at my own gender issues and I, I feel like there's a, I wish I could remember it a little bit mm. better, but I remember everybody knew about it. It was open, like classic childhood onset gender dysphoria. I remember Ken yeah. said the whole town knows about it when it's <laughs> child. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, the whole, everybody knew who I was. I was well known for this. Okay. And so out and proud with my thing, if you follow me with my gender distress or gender, whatever, you know what I mean? I was boy, whatever. And then somewhere along the way, in and around puberty, oh my God, I became pathologically secretive mm. about it. Why? That's if you follow me, everybody knew it. Everybody yeah. saw it. It was visible. I never wore anything girlish. So it was, it was visible. So how could I hide it? And yet it became this awful secret because I've always interpreted this as because I was trying to get out of it. But I'm like, going, isn't it interesting? And at the same time, I'm just I'm putting something together here. At the same time, I was having these extraordinarily intense crushes on boys, like all consuming. Yeah. And it's like, you see, there's it feels like it was some sort of beginning of a sexual identity was getting yeah. merged into yeah. a gender, something sexual. And that's why I had an, an animal instinct to make it secret. Yeah. It, it was a laughable. Where, where was my secret? <laughs> but I suppose yeah. my secret became that I'm trying to get out of it. But yeah. why was it so secretive? Why was I so ashamed? So why was I so, so, so secretive? It feels mm. like there was a sexual component as well as I was embarrassed and I felt yeah. everybody was pandering to me and laughing at me or maybe or could if I tried to backtrack. It's just very interesting that, that I think that that happened on some level. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress, Genspect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, Rhyme. Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And now back to the conversation. It makes me wonder about something in your story that like, kind of feels similar to what's happening today, which is another way that I think they move from like bi or pan to trans is like, if you, um, if your claimed identity is getting you called out or your people are giving you like sideways glances like, okay, Stella, the girl who thinks she's a boy. Like if you're actively being called out and your body during puberty is starting to betray your male persona, you know, not being taken seriously is sometimes I think a catalyst for people looking for a new label, like looking for a new way to be. Oh, yeah, and I think yeah, with yeah. The, the buy and the pan, in my experience, I also think... Oh. They're not taken that seriously. Like no. a lot of kids at school, even if You're they're, right. you know, they're not taken that seriously. And it's kind of like laughable. And, you know, I've met a lot of kids who like they tried to, for example, or non-binary. I mean, how do we not talk about non-binary? Non-binary is a very common one, too, on this pathway. But like, mm. you know, if you're a girl and you say you're non-binary, some guys are going to be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, do you want to like have sex? Like they don't care. But if you say you're trans, there's a little distance. I think that oh, people, people sit will up. take. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you're really different. They start to have a little bit of like reservations about getting close to you. So sometimes I think it's a protective mechanism. And then on the other side of that coin, sometimes being trans kind of puts you at the top of the hierarchy within like the LGBT club at school or like within a certain peer group online. And then all of a sudden you have the authority to speak about certain matters. Like, you know how Helena talks about this kind of 
hierarchy within social justice and like whoever the most oppressed group is gets to kind of have the say in how things are understood. And I guess being trans is the pinnacle of, of that hierarchy. Like, I'm not saying that I disagree or agree with it. I'm just saying within that framework of conceptualizing who fits in where. So it's weird. Like, it's like, I think sometimes being trans gives you more safety in certain contexts than at other times it actually gives you like popularity and authority. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the child uh, who comes out as bi and comes out as pansexual, it often doesn't land the way they think it is. They, yeah. There's often a slight innocence to their bi and pansexual identity. And when they come out, they think everybody's going to go, whoa, really? And instead <laughs> they see kind of hidden smiles and that must yeah. be nice for you. And they hear little asides that are a little bit dismissive and, oh, she's pan. I can hear it about, I can hear my own children say, oh, yeah, she's pansexual. And it's it's not said with massive respect. Do, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's kind of, it's yeah. almost derogatory. It's just like, oh, yeah, right. And um, if I was them, if I was that kid, I'd say, I'll make you listen. I'll mm. make you take me seriously. Do you know what I mean? So it, it does feel like, yeah, I was only playing around. Now I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older and I'm a bit more serious now. And please yeah. take me seriously. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, even when, when we had Lisa Duval on the program and she was talking about how kids, some kids don't have anything really to rebel against. And how, like, the kid can come out as, oh as all these different labels and the parents are very, like, nonchalant about it. And they're like, okay, that's fine, honey. You're bisexual. Okay, great. You know, and, you know, let us know what you need. And then, okay, well, uh, what about pansexual? And the parent's like, oh, pansexual. Great. Tell me what that means. Okay, no, no problem. And it's almost like in some cases, not all, but I think in some cases, the kids are looking for where is the boundary of edgy behavior I can take on that's actually going to stir up something in my parents. And Helena talked yeah. about this too. Like yeah. she'd come out as some kind of sexuality and her mom didn't care at all. And she said, in my mind, I had this fantasy of this like huge blow up that we were going to have this intense uh. conversation or like my mom questioning me. And, you know, on the surface we think, well, kids don't want their parents to be mad at them. Yeah. But if you're feeling kind of ignored, you just want some sort of engagement to some degree. And even if you're not feeling good, if you're feeling like big things are happening, which they are, and you want it almost declared, yeah. if you follow me, I could see how you'd come out as bisexual. And it's almost like huge things are happening. <laughs> yeah, you know I, I mean? know. Yeah. And yeah. they are all sorts of genie. Like what goes through the, their <laughs> yeah. bodies? Like what's going on is massive. And so um if it's not met with sufficient gravitas and it's not met yeah. with taken seriously, I could see how they'll say, okay, well, uh I don't think that was really taken seriously. I could see and I don't think they're consciously No, it's this. subconscious. Yeah. Yes. And they think, oh, well, well, I, I, I've thought about this some more and I, I think I'm pansexual. And, you know, the, 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 the parent could still just nod along. And I've heard, I remember working with somebody and, you know, she said, you know, I'm I'm bisexual and pansexual. And, you know, the parent was blah, 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 blah. and then she said, I'm trans. And the parent said, no, mm. it was completely different. Her voice changed. It was no. And the child was like, what's this all about? Yeah. Because the child was unbeknownst to themselves. The child was looking for a reaction. Not no, but they right. were looking for a reaction. Yes. They were looking for a, hello, I'm not the little kid I used to be. I'm changing. I'm new. I'm very different. Things are happening here. Yeah. That's what yeah. they were kind of looking yeah. for. Yeah, 100%. But what they got was, oh, isn't that nice for you? And a bit of a hidden smile. Or, yeah. Who do you fancy? And they're like, ah, I don't want to talk about who I fancy. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean yes <laughs> crikey oh, yeah. that's not the conversation I'm looking for in a way what they were looking for is you know those coming of age films they were looking for coming yeah. of age conversations well, that's right that's right yeah, yeah. you know it, it, this is something we talked about a lot in the book it's like th this idea of separation so it's like you know, I, I tend to think about things in contrasts. I think like in Helena's case, her family was super distracted and she want, she explicitly in hindsight says, I wanted attention. And then in other families, like the Lisa Duval kind of families, 
they're so attached and so deeply connected and this teenager is trying to differentiate him or herself slightly from the parents especially i think in the case of girls and this is a way of of finding that edgy thing that actually ruffles mom's feathers and it's a way to yeah. kind of individuate and separate so i think you're right mm. it's like a coming of age attempt it's an attempt yeah. at saying i'm not that innocent little kid you thought i was and they wait yeah. for the reaction if like oh you're pan that's so cute Oh, you're by. That's so sweet. I don't want to be sweet. Yeah. I, I want to shock you a little bit. I want to surprise you because I'm surprised by the feelings I'm having and the things that are going on within me. Yeah, I, I think one thing I think I'd like to rest on for a minute is this boundaries thing. And I have it with my own kids and I've, I've total, I totally get it. We say it so flippantly, the kids have nothing to push against. But it's actually massive. What are we going to do? Yeah. They have nothing to push against. They need to push against. We have a huge societal issue here. And I, I don't know what we can do because I can see it like with my own kids. They want to push against something. And they have nothing to push against. What is that? That's a problem. I, I just feel like that's a huge problem. And I, I don't know what we're going to do about this societally. Because it's always happened that parents put down these boundaries and the children pushed against them. Mm -hmm. And now we don't have that. It seems like we're almost one of the first generations that don't. And I don't know where it's going. It seems to be, it's, it's um, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Mm -hmm. The children are finding things and that feels very destructive and frightening. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a... That's something I've thought a lot about. And it's like, what do you do? I mean, do you erect kind of arbitrary boundaries just because? I mean, that seems yeah, silly. No, seems mad. But you know, um, I, I want to share a story that I remember from when I was in graduate school. We had a clinical class where we had, um, we kind of basically did scenarios and with other peers pretending like we were in therapy, but we all had a supervisor who was a graduate oh, yeah. student. I remember that. Yeah, we did that. I, yeah, it, it was really fun. It was my favorite yeah, class because really it was like the hands-on experience. Yeah. And I remember one time I was working with my supervisor and he said something about like, well, when I have kids, I'm going to, during board games, I'm going to cheat sometimes. And I said, what? Why, why would you do that? And he was like, because kids need to know that sometimes the world is not fair. And I thought, well, this is stupid. You know, I was like really upset and I didn't understand. And I thought, you're going to teach them to break the rules. You're going to teach them to be sneaky. And as I've worked with more and more families, I, I realized like what he meant and how valuable that was, which is that sometimes there are barriers and limitations and roadblocks. And if kids don't learn that those exist and they can't learn to manage those when they're erected by their parents who love them and care for them, they're going to have a really hard time dealing with limitations in the real world. And like this parental boundaries thing is so interesting because you're right. Like if you love your children and you have their best interest at heart and you feel like you're not allowed to sometimes say no, what does that mean for your child's expectations of, of the world and of other people who frankly don't really give a crap about your children as much as you do? So it, it's it's a really deep question. I think you're right to bring it up. And I think you've hit on something there because if you think about moving from bisexual to pansexual, it's a kind of declaration of lack of limits. There are no limits, which is part of that queer th theory thinking. And trans, mm. there are no limits. I can be a boy, I can be a girl, I can be non-binary, I can yeah. be whatever I want. There are no limits in my world. It's a very yeah. childlike way of thinking. It's very kind of, it's magical kind of thinking. It's childlike. Albert Ellis, you know, the kind of grandfather of Ori BT, he used to call it, which <laughs> I always giggle at, he used to call it masturbating. Yes, I said love that masturbating. <laughs> this is the, I, I explained Do this to someone the other day. <laughs> Really, Sasha, you naughty girl. But there are three musts that hold us back, according to Albert Ellis. I must do well, mm. you must treat me well, and the world must be easy. And Albert Ellis said those three musts hold us back. 
Yeah. I must do well. You must treat me well and the world must be easy. And he's right, I believe. Yes. And it, it, it is, you could argue the core of so much of our mental distress. One of those three. You, you know what I mean? Totally. I must do well. You yes. must treat me well. Yes. The world must be easy. Now, everything about pansexual, the move from bisexual to actually no limits here, no limits. And then over to transgender identity, no limits. We don't do limits. We're the new generation. Don't fence me in. We do whatever we want. And it's fundamental task of adolescence is to learn. Actually, no, there's limits all over the place. You can't help but be the person who was born to the parents you were born to. You cannot but be the child who comes from the childhood you came from. You yeah. have been limited in many ways yeah. and are limited by gravity. You know what yeah. I mean? We are yes. limited so way. Yes. And it's like in our in our bid to give kids this kind of lovely childhood, which we've really tried as a collective, we've really tried. We've taught them this lack of limits idea and it's 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 rooted in unhappiness. We'll be very unhappy when you think you've no limits. You have to come to terms with limits, yeah. not declare war on limits. Yeah. Oh Brighton. my gosh. This went in a direction I really didn't expect, but that is profound. I think you're right. Yeah. And and ironically, ironically, I mean, there's something incredibly structured and rule based and limited about the whole process of having to identify a certain way in order to huh. make space for your ambivalent feelings or just take your own time with things like that's an ironically limiting process. And so this it's, is very interesting. It's yeah. like the child. OK, I'm going to live this limitless life because I'm filled with kind of magical thinking and, you know, there's no limits in my life. I'm going to declare, you know, freedom of identity, freedom of sexuality. Great. And then there's the human nature uh, wanting limits, wanting boundaries. And what do you know, this free identity I come with is riddled with rules and boundaries and limits. And because I, do you follow me? I know yes. I might, we might have yeah, slipped no, into yes, total psychological. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting because they actually, as we all know, we want boundaries and limits because it feels chaotic without exactly. it. Exactly. It's, it's containment. Oh, it helps I us know, know it's what to expect. destabilizing without it. It's yeah. rules. It's clarity. It's predictability. I mean, that's so important. Like when we think about psychology 101 and what do kids need, like if you had to boil it down to one word and one word only, stability. Oh, it's it's the most yeah. important thing that kids need. And so these yeah. rules create like these all these gender related rules almost create a new version of some kind of predictable stability. Ironically, though, their identities are unstable and they keep shifting from one thing to another. So, I mean, from that perspective, it's like, you know, there's a cynical way to look at it and then there's a generous way to look at it. I think on one end of the spectrum, this shows a real destabilization of identity and kids kind of flailing around aimlessly not knowing where to land yeah and i think that can be true and i think at the same time as therapists we know multiple things can be true at the same time pushing against limits and exploring boundaries and discovering new versions of yourself is also a part of your job at that age mm. so uh, you know i i don't know if that means we have um We've definitively like solved this issue, but I do think there's a lot of interesting dynamics you can explore when you start thinking about all these kids with all these labels that keep shifting from one to the other. And then, of course, you know, we will probably talk about this more in another show, but, you know, the, the pan and bi labels do not involve any kind of physical alter, altering the body, any kind of intervention. But of course, a trans identity does. Yeah, a huge amount. And yeah. often children, because they're living in a world where they're not actually um, looking at the kind of the, the brass tacks, the actual yeah. reality of it. They're just thinking trans is the same as bi. It's just a different identity. And they're not yeah. thinking of, oh, my God, one is a huge impact, massive medical burden. Yeah. and The other has none at all. Um, one thing, though, I just want to touch on before we, we come to the end is that on the basis of our discussion, 
if a child comes out as bi or pansexual, often it gets under under received. Mm, mm-hmm. Should now we've had this conversation, part of me is thinking, I wonder should not take it massively, not stop yeah. everything. But yeah. yeah. Should it be mm-hmm. met with gravity, I wonder now. Here's a phrase I, I invite parents to use. I, I invite them to say something like you know, I'm really glad you told me that. Um, as you get older, there are going to be new things about you that we didn't know and that surprise yeah. us. And I, nice. and I love you very much. Because I think like you were saying earlier, I'm not the innocent kid you thought I was. Parents do need to honor that. And I, mm. you don't have to take it literally. Like you're not going to say, okay, great. Now that you're bisexual, I'm going to like tell every person I know that I have a bisexual child. Like give it time. But, yeah. you know, say, oh, there are going to be things about you that you discover that we didn't know. And and that way it's kind of general and you kind of honor that like desire to show the parent that something weird's happening within me. Like, yeah, there is weird stuff happening within you. Mm. Rather than saying... I mean, I, I totally empathize with why parents would say this, but rather than saying, well, you don't know yet because you're young. That's like so anticlimactic for the teenager. It's like, no, mm. I'm figuring things out about myself. And like, you, I just think you have to honor that if that makes sense. Mm. It does. I'm trying to put myself in, in, in the shoes and I'm thinking, how would I genuinely react? Yeah. And I think it would be a lot, you know, just to, to go there. I think it would be the long the lines of, Oh, really? What made you think that? Yeah. Where did that come from? And when did that start? And I I think that's where I would go. It would be like, oh, what was the arc of coming to that understanding? When did that first happen? Yeah. Oh, and what's your understanding of that? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I'd be going. Yeah, you'd ask a lot of questions. I think that's great. I would ask a lot of questions. the kid wants to tell you something different's happening so asking questions is a really good way of like like i see you i see something big's happening tell me about it and i want to see you and i I don't know if i'm seeing the whole picture so could you invite me in and show me more because if they moved from bi to pan i think i'd go oh and what's the difference and tell me all about that if they kind of ranted on in that slightly monotone i've (laughs) i've learned things from the computer i think i'd think it could be very valuable to personalize it and say, and for you, how, what has the experience been? And for yeah. you, how has yeah. it been different? I'm very same if you're going from pan to trans. So what's, what's been the arc? When did you first think you might be trans? What was that? And trying to get beyond the wall of words. Yeah. Because the, the wall slogans. of words is, yeah, that's, that's a kind of a, that's a blockage to intimacy. You're trying yeah, to and get them more I personal. I totally agree. I totally agree. And and I don't know if you've heard this before, but a lot of times parents will try to ask more questions and be open-ended. Okay. And the kids don't know because they're just Not repeating notion. something they read on the internet. So and, yeah, it's hard. The kids don't know. And this is where a crucial point happens. The child declares confidently and with a plum. The parent goes, Really? you know, and ask a couple of questions. Then they see this little girl going, whoop, 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 and they, they close it. Yeah. If you follow me, the conversation is closed there. And I wonder, should it be lifted back open and say, well, we have a look at that again. That's very interesting. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Because big things are going on in these kids. Yeah. Big things are going on, but it's not necessary. Just because it's got the name of pan sexual, it could be, you know, it could be titled Genie. I'm going through a lot here, mommy. Yeah, yeah. That's that's just important to recognize that something big is happening and not get too bogged down in the weeds or the details of it, but honor that something big is happening and stay stay open and listen and and you can, you know, parents can also share their observations a little bit. Maybe, oh, well, I, I see it this way. You can see it a different way. And that kind of yeah. leaves everyone a little room to figure things out. And I like carrying things with a light touch. Yeah. But honor the seriousness if they're serious. Yeah. You know, and I, I am generally quite playful. But if, it's a, if it feels serious, I think meet it. That d- Don't smile at that because that's very yeah. undermining. Yeah. 
Well, we've we've covered this in some detail. It's an interesting topic, and I think it like opens the door for a lot of fascinating like philosophical questions about childhood and development yeah. and all these things. So, I'd love uh, to hear um, listeners' comments because I think people yeah. are going to come in with lots of interesting points around these these yeah. where where we went today. I think could be very interesting. If I'd love to see the comments online, you know, on YouTube. Yeah, for sure. Do leave comments in our YouTube or leave reviews and mention the episode or however. Uh, there's lots of ways. So you'll hear more about that when we kind of sign out. So this was great. And I guess we will we'll see everybody next Friday. I guess so. Yep. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.